Um, today, we're going to make a, uh, a small blown hobnail perfume bottle uh, using an offhand style of flame working that I learned when I was 14, or began learning when I was 14, uh, from a gentleman named uh, John Burton and his student, uh, Maggie Yud. And um, I'm working today over a uh, oxygen propane uh, torch. This is a champion uh, from Bethlehem. And why I always call this a, an offhand style of flame working is because ra unlike uh, scientific working, I'm actually using a glass blowpipe and working on the end of it, you know, so it's like a miniaturized form of, of certain offhand techniques. clean off the end a little bit here. And I'm going to be using um, my dark blue green and my coral red formulas to do my color for this piece. I mixed up a piece beforehand. And this is a combination. This is a, a, a form from a formula I developed of uh, uh, germanium, uh, cobalt, and silver. And it'll give me that, that dark brown, or, or I mean dark green uh, uh, sort of shifting background with blues and things in it. And, and then it'll make a nice, uh, the, the transparent hobnails over it will make a nice contrast between the two. I'm going to start by putting a little bit of extra glass on to get a, a little bit of a gather, a little bit of a bubble. Actually, I don't think I need that. Nope, I need more. I'm just getting used to this torch. I don't always work on it. So I'm going to just do a continuous coil. It's not touching. Wrapping about an inch and a half here. And I'm working on a 12 uh, millimeter heavy wall diameter blowpipe. Start to fuse my coils in. It'll take a minute. Just let heat and rotation and gravity uh, melt and consolidate the glass here. Just taking my time uh, advancing the cavity down to the, the end of the bubble here. I 
I'm doing that because I don't want to thin out the bubble's connection to the blowpipe very much. Um, one of the characteristics of borosilicate is that it has a kind of a shape memory it develops when it has been superheated. When it's been the most heated the last time, whatever shape it then pools in, it remembers. And so if you blow out your bubble very thin at the top, um, every time you go to, to expand it again, it's going to want to blow out more where it is very thin. It will just say, oh, that's where I'm supposed to be here. It's also where all the heat is really accessible to the glass, so it can move. So now we have a nice little bubble. It's not going to be a very big piece because I want to try to complete the whole thing. Um, I'm going to put a little reinforcing stripes on, and that's just going to help me as I am uh, melting my first layer of color in. It'll keep the uh, it'll help keep the the attachment between the uh, bubble and the blowpipe straight. And now, take my piece of color. And this time the rings will be touching because uh, borosilicate uh, does not flow into itself. So if you have a gap, the gap's going to remain. It's not going to close up, uh, unlike soft glass, where that, that can kind of happen. There we go. And one of the issues people have who uh, work with a lot of intense color especially uh, a heat reactive color, is um, burning off a haze, burning off like a, a, a gray or a, a, a muddy looking haze. Um, and I'm not certain exactly what that fume is, but um, it is something that uh, happens when you, maybe a chemical reaction or something like that. I'm, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know. Um, and, and uh, if you do not burn that initial haze off as you are incorporating the glass, as you are melting the glass, it'll cause the uh, coating to kind of bind and it becomes very hard to remove it. You, have, you can burn it off, but it becomes very difficult. So this is kind of one of those moments there where people who say, oh, I don't know if porous silicate has any good color, but you know, that's part of the reason. So I'm going to try and show you a little bit about the kind of heat. What you want is something like a, an oxidizing or oxidizing to neutral setting to strip off that haze. A little spot here to show you. There we go. Put that back. And this haze is kind of distinct from just like the nice silvery fuming you can get when you have a heavily loaded piece of color afterwards. That, that is a different beast and um, will look nice and, and you can kind of manipulate a little bit. So here we have a, let me put that to cool. You can kind of see the transition. Um, just stop the way for it to cool. Glass, glass has its own schedule. It's turning dark here. So you can see that's, that's this stripped down true color underneath, to my mind, true color. And that gray stuff, that's the stuff that if you're working with the uh, blue and, and green amber purples can, you know, set up and be very stubborn to get rid of. Nope, nope. 
Emang sering? But if you have a nice hot torch, it should be doable. more punch in my <laughs> so there you can see some of the haze being a little bit stubborn coming off because I mixed up a pretty intense piece to work with today. And always when I stop to demonstrate this to students, that's when it gets hard to get rid of, of that haze in the end. Let's get it beaten back a little more. Wait a second for it to set up. And I'm because the reinforcing stripes now have fused in to some degree, they're not going to give me the kind of stiffening I want, so I'm going to go back over them once. And then I'm going to just use a finer flame to uh, try and eliminate a bit more of that haze. And this is more of an issue with an intense color I make uh, than some commercial colors, because a lot of the commercial colors don't have quite the high concentration that hand mixing will give you. Come on, you. There we go. Okay. All right, that's that's getting pretty good. I'm going to just 
to some degree ignore that little extra haze that's still hanging out at the very top. We're just going to go on because we want to see the, how the hobnails are done. Blow this out a little bit. Oops, I blew it out too hard. There we go. But let that set up again and also let it cool. Part of the uh, trick of using uh, the very heat reactive colors, and I'll, I'll show you here I have one I made the other day, where you can see some sparkle behind that hobnail. You let your uh, color, you let, you let your bubble get cool, and then in about a, a minute, minute, or a half a minute or something, you flash it in a flame and it brings up a layer of silver from inside the, the color. And the layer of silver will then be captured when you put your transparent on top of it. You can even do it with just clear. Um, so we're doing pretty good here. And I, I did that just to check the glow underneath there in the shadow. So now I'm going to. So there you can see now, I've got a lot of, uh, more of an of a opaline blue or something on the surface now, and that's the silver um, over the uh, dark blue background. Okay, and I'll turn down my torch. And I have a nice little piece. This is a combination of copper, silver, and germanium dioxide. Um, when I first started learning these techniques, when I was 14 in 1969, um, borosilicate had extremely limited palette and not very nice. And you had to hand mix all of your own color. And in about 1970, I think it was, another student in my class, Larry Ward, figured out that when you combine copper oxide with germanium dioxide, it goes from being a horrible brick red to being this lovely transparent ruby red. It was the first really good red that ever existed in uh, borosilicate. Um, and, you know, uh, there have been some innovations and some improvements on that red over the years, but it's, it's one of the basic formulas for a nice red. That will be too close together. Maybe that's a little too far apart. There we go. What I'm doing now, I'm just applying a kind of a guide. That first set of hobnails will allow me then to put a large row in, and that's what I'm going to pull my neck out of. Um, all of this will give it a uniform pull rather than having a bunch of little small dots kind of fighting with each other as they're being pulled. They don't, glad, the borosilicate only wants to flow in one direction. So uh, if you have a bunch of little tiny dots, then they, they fight with each other. They just don't want to go anywhere. But when you have a nice long spacer road pull out of that are uniform, it'll give you a, a chance to pull a nice neck. that in. So I just build up my pattern as I'm going. Um, very often they're pretty similar patterns, but just 
each piece has its own appearance. Uh, the colors will be different each time, or how it how it kind of flows, its shape affects it. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna seat these now, and then go on with the next uh, band. And I'm also trying not to like oxidize and burn off the uh, silver from the surface. Now I want to, I still want to keep that captured, so I'm trying to be a little bit careful with it. Okay. I, I normally work on a PM2D. I work on a, on a water-cooled PM2D at home, and I can put my arm on the, <laughs> I can rest my wrist actually against the barrel because it's cool. Uh, this one I have to kind of perch my hand on it. It is a very lovely torch, and it, it does have a very excellent cooling system, but uh, not quite as cool as my PM2D. And to get these little tiny dots that I'm doing here, my little, little tiny ones, you can see that I am just slightly heating the face of the bubble. The bubble's pretty thick, so it's not going to distort. Um, and I'm just passing the very tip through the edge of the flame and dabbing it onto the surface and then pulling back through the flame. That's how I get those little tiny, tiny dots. Build that up. Uh oh, this will take. There we go. Ouch. <sighs> That for a minute. When you're doing this kind of uh, kind of protracted application, you you do want to periodically heat everything up. Everything down here is getting significantly colder than it is where I'm working, and um, and you can crack things. I've learned my timing over 48 years, so I'm, I don't have too much trouble with that. But just just a reminder. Also resting this a little bit against the side too, which helps me stay steady. Finish this little bit of powder here. Oh, wait. 
lost track here. There we go. Uh, a little ahead of myself. There we are. Got to get rid of that little clot there. Now we can put another bit of the design in and then we'll fuse that. And my color rod's getting shorter and shorter. I think I can get through. So I, I definitely want to fuse in all those little teeny tiny guys because they've only they're just very lightly tacked on. Uh, and so if I were to knock it against the side of the torch or something, it, it could well dislodge some of the powder. And although borosilicate has very little viscosity and it, and it sets up rapidly, when it is that glowing, it will still distort if you, you know, aren't rotating it or holding it in line with gravity. So um, I'm just waiting to let it set up. It's pretty set up now, but you've got to see the glow go out of it before you start moving it around again. Okay. No, no, move it less. Variation on my pattern here.
So I'm just staggering my size a little bit. Just to have a variation. Very often I do uh, another section of the very tiny hobnails, but I'm going to spare you some of that. Okay, because we want to see the technique all the way through. Okay, there we go. Ouch. <laughs> so now I will fuse this in and then we will get the shape we want to pull the neck from. And we'll finish the piece up. I developed, my, when I first learned to have a good fast rotation, uh, I, we, I was taught only to rotate in one direction. And then when I started doing these hobnail patterns in the late 70s, I didn't like the way the, the dots swiveled. So I began doing this kind of back and forth, a few turns one way, a few turns back. and. Um, found I could kind of stabilize my pattern and not have it drift as much. And at the same time, I, now I'm not very able to stop doing it. <laughs> it's, it's become a, like a conscious thing, or an unconscious thing on my part. Um, so I, that I always do that. Um, and when I have beginners in my class, sometimes I, I'm confusing them. I feel bad about it, but there's not much I can do. Because it's hard to, you have, you know, it takes a little effort, a little mu muscle memory to develop a good rotation that's steady and doesn't have a lot of halt to it. And it's easier if you just go ahead and just go in one direction initially. Let that set up. And this is a good shape to be working with to pull just a, a real simple bottle form out of. You want some thickness. You want it elongated. If you, if you start out with a very round bubble, you're going to pull like a short, thin neck, and it'll be more like a jar. I've had you know students having that problem. Um, but if you have a pretty thick cavity inside, and I can kind of feel by the heft that, it, that I've got a pretty good wall thickness. Uh, then when you go to heat the, uh, and pull the neck, uh, you have a lot of material to, to extend your neck with. It won't be too thin, and uh, it'll be easier to control. So I'm going to punty onto the bottom. In the original set of techniques John Burton taught us, um, most of the time you did not use a punty to pull. You, you just used gravity, you, you just heated it and drooped it as you were rotating it. Um, I found after a while that I prefer this technique because it gives you more control over your shape. And I, I wish I could give you guys some wonderful trick for putting your punty on straight, but I don't have one, you just do it. You just practice and you just do it. And, if it isn't straight, then you redo it. And I have my days when I'm redoing them. Down to the vertical here. Just let it hang. This is about a half seal on my punty. And I kind of feel to see if I have any pronounced crankshaft movement, and I don't, so I think I'm good. And let's see if I can get my flame adjusted here. So I'm going to just aim for those lar that row of large hobnails. So, and you can appreciate now, I've been heating this for uh, quite a few seconds, and it's still not flopping around on me. So this is a, a relatively thick wall. And I'm going to 
just adjust this down a bit. Now that I have the heat into it. And I don't mind if the uh, pattern on the neck drifts a little bit. That's fine. I think that, that little swirl adds some interest to it. And I'm not really pulling in the flame so much, but now with movement and, and uh, the glass becoming fluid, it is starting to constrict down on its own. And then I'm holding this with two fingers. Um, if, you, if you're using your whole hand to grip something that's moving, that's still fluid, um, you can, you'll, you'll, you'll tend to grip it like that, and, and gravity will pull the glass off. As stubborn and hard to move as, as borosilica can be at times, <laughs> uh, it does move, and it, and it will go someplace. And I just adjusted my attachment there a tiny, tiny bit, a little bit like uh, straightening a, a point, by pushing a little bit back onto the low pipe. I think that looks pretty good. Clean off my end here. And now we're going to change this shape and also unstrike the colors. These are colors that are heat reactive. Um, and uh, the silver and germanium in particular are what cause uh, the shift in colors. Although, well, also with the copper, with the copper hotness, that also is part of it process too. Cobalt by itself is not reactive with germanium. But silver and germanium are just a very natural pair in terms of color effect. So in unstriking it, I'm, I'm taking a lot of the color uh, down to its most transparent state or if we were just working with a transparent color, trying to get it back to it, looking like it's almost clear, the way, you know, like a, a nice piece made with Elvis or something would look. Elvis is a, a commercial ruby red. That did sound odd. Elvis, how oh, Elvis looked. No. And then we're going to do a little flame strike on this. And for, for pieces like this, I do not anneal them in a kiln. Um, I, I will coat this with carbon, mainly because the uh, coiled foot is only a half seal. Um, and so there's a little bit of strain in that. I coat it with carbon to kind of ease the, the temperature transition, and I'll just put it into a bucket of vermiculite. Um, so here you can see now, we've gone from that, that very blue, kind of slightly light blue uh, background to a, uh, again, more of that, that dark green. And then you can see all of the red has gone out of those hobnails. So that's a completely unstruck piece of color. You let it cool down, and then you can just turn down your flame and just very gently brush it to bring the color back. Um, in, in this piece I made beforehand, you can see that I have a couple of transitional 
phases there between the yellow and the red. So the yellow is the unstruck state, and the red is the um, reheated and struck state. It's kind of, I don't know that the way I use the term strike and unstrike is any kind of like scientific term or something like that. It's just, it's just a, a handy way to discuss it, the, the, this action. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to nick up the bottom a little bit here. And maybe just let it brush the bottom of those hobnails. Tiny, tiny, tiny. So now we've got a little, yeah, there we go. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more on that. There we go. So you can see some of the transition involved in that. Actually, I think I'm going to change that slightly. Out. Ah, there we go. It's hard for me to see in this light, the exact color. Yeah, so now I've got, a, I've got another little streak of the blue. I'm going to put an, a little knob on the bottom here to uh, give me something to attach my trail to. And I'm going to wind a nice base. I hope. If, if there's things that I redo frequently, um, and I thought I had everything, but I actually don't have what I want here. Uh, okay, I'll just, I'll just put this one on a hold. Um, things that I will actually redo fairly frequently. Uh, besides the straightening out my punties, uh, are the feet. I'm, sometimes the feet just aren't working. I'll have a bad foot day. And I'll just keep replacing them. My uh, first teacher, uh, Margaret Yud, uh really grounded me in a lot of techniques. She's, she was a wonderful teacher and she used to, she, she came from Yorkshire, England, um, and she used to come over to me and say, oh, Susie, it's a very pretty pat in there, but that, that puts a pig's ear. <laughs> you should do something else, you know. And, and so I just learned that I had to just really concentrate on technique and practice. And, and that's true of a lot of forms of glass. Um, just learning to work with the glass and learning the techniques that give you a chance to accomplish what you want. And you want to get your knob really well seated. Here, you don't want any seams or undercut. A really good attachment. This is just a maker's mark. I'm, I'm going to use the my initial of my last name, F. And I, I just do it because people, it's very difficult to sign these um, with any kind of little, you know, pen or anything. So I'm just putting a little indication on here. 
And then I always wrap around it so you can hardly see it. <laughs> but it, it enables me to tell customers that yes, it is signed. There we go. Let's clean off my ends so I have a good attachment. So you want to warm this up a little bit. You're working with your flame turned down. It's kind of a balancing act. You, you want enough heat, but you want to be able to control your rod. You're just heating on the bottom side. And uh, using the slightly stiff upper side to help you guide and shape your coil. And then you just wipe off. It can, it can be a little hard sometimes to stop, you know, you're going so good. Uh, and then I'm just going to, oop, lightly heat around the perimeter. I want to also put a second little bead of red just to sort of finish the piece off. And in order to true up my foot, I am just coming down, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with one hand, very lightly, um, not pressing hard. You want to do it one-handed when you make your touch, because if you do it with both hands, you're going to go off. Again, we're going to come down very lightly, not pressing hard. Looks pretty straight. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off my oxygen. I'm just coating this with carbon. And then I'm going to do something that's very naughty on these torches. I'm going to turn off my center fire, which you should never, ever do. <laughs> and. Um, because it's just not good for them. It's, it, that's part of their cooling system to have their center fire going. Um, but I'm going to turn it off just for a second so I just have that bushy outer flame. It will sort of behave like a, a flame on a miner or something like that. And that will just enable me to strike back that rim because I have that redhead unstruck and was transparent and now will go back. And it's just, it, it seems to be harder to do it if you have the whole flame on. So I found this is a successful way to do it. Uh, let's see, turn that off, that off, and then turn this on. Hopefully nobody from uh, Bethlehem is watching me. There we go. So just doing that little touch up got, gave you my red back. Coat that for another second or two. So how's my timing? What we, what can we do? Oh, at the very least, we'll be able to do open the, the lip on that. So we'll, we'll go that one more step. Um, making the matching stoppers can be quite tedious. Uh, 
to do, so I don't know if we quite have time for that. We'll see. So now it's going into the vermiculite. There we go. And in about an hour, hour and a half, it'll be cool. And I'll do this next step with it. Here. So I have this piece I made yesterday. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just heat a little bit in the carbon flame just above my reinforcing stripes. And that's just to ensure that if there's any strain set up in there, it doesn't just check and, and kind of pop off part of my neck. So I'm just easing a little heat into it. And you don't have to do that for very long. off my extra here. I just popped open a little bit of that so the air will evacuate. And you can do this when it's cold. If, if, you're, if you're finishing off a piece that's hot, um, which I only do when it doesn't have a trail foot on it, uh, you are running the risk of having the uh, hot glass in the top just suck in. It's just a, a, a sort of a physical fact of life. Um, and people have trouble with that at times. So if, if you can hold a piece in a holder or in your hand or something like that, it's, it's an it's, it's a easy way to do it. Now I'm going to flare this out and then trim it. Size. These are our old tools. This is actually a, a reproduction. I'll show you my, this, this is my 48 year old tool, which used to look like that. <laughs> so it's, it's worn down. Uh, a friend of mine sent, when, when Margaret Yude retired, she uh, gave me her equipment and her chemicals. And um, I had, so I had an extra one of these and a friend of mine saw that and he said, oh, could I send that to Jim Moore? and have him make, make me a, a brass reamer. And, uh, and I said, sure, and he sent it to Jim, and they returned, they're very lovely people. And you can buy a brass reamer like that, which is just perfect for this particular task, um, to flare out these rather small lips. And you need, a, for, for something that's relatively thick, the way I work the glass, you need a pretty good sized pair of shears. The, the little Japanese scissors are a little bit too light for what I'm doing.
pull that out. Shaking. A little bit. I'm going to trim it down just a tiny bit more. So I think what I'll do, since I think I'm, I still have a few minutes left, is I will just show you the technique for making the stopper, but it won't be decorated. The decoration is the same process as I used on the uh, bottle. So a bit more there. And so I'll show you how to do the stem real quick, just on uh, one that's a single color. And I've got a nice flare on there. All looks pretty proportioned. Let's do a little. I actually have to. Take this off real quick. I have to wrap my arm because I'm fair, and over the years I've become kind of heat reactive with the uh, uh, warmth coming off of the flame while I'm blowing bubbles. There we go. Um, so I have these. There we go. So this is a piece of eight mil. You can use a half inch. I, I think this is probably a better diameter for that particular size neck. And at home I have lots of mismatched stoppers that I keep so that I can sort of plumb the depth of pieces I'm making that are not transparent. Uh, just sort of figure out what that inner diameter is. I'm just going to wrap. Some around this. Look in there. Okay.
see. Okay. Oh, that's definitely pretty good, yeah. So this is just the process for making a matching stopper. I'm gonna block in a little bit of a point here, and then I'm going to pull the wand. And then we'll see if it fits. Just a little bit of a point there. It's pretty good. And it's important to have your punty on pretty straight in particular, or you're going to have a, a crooked stopper. And sometimes the simplest of the stoppers are the worst to get straight. Let's see how this looks. That's a little bit long, so I'm going to attach a clear wand to it. Sometimes it's nice when you can have color all the way down, but uh, I want to do this quick. Gather my drop up here. You know, I do have some stuff left here. Yeah. My flame is becoming a bit of a mess here. Just making that into a more uniform blank. Now I'm going to fuse these two ends together here. Hopefully straight. And we'll pull a thinner wand.
So no, but now let's see. Let's see if we got it. So it's two more. Okay. Take this bit off. Still too long. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, that's what happens when you don't get your base on properly. Um, uh, anyway, uh, this now, now I'm quite embarrassed, uh, but that's good. Um, this definitely can be repaired. That's true. There. Okay. Yeah. And now what I would do with that bit is I would grind that stopper. But first I have to reattach this to a blowpipe and repair it, which we don't have time for. So we'll do that later. <laughs> um, okay, I guess that's it. <laughs> oh, God. 